An unprecedented display of anger and frustration in the streets of Cuba on pues, Sunday. Se fueron expandiendo al resto del país, alcanzando huevos, repito, todas las provincias Authorities have resorted to assault, arrest and internet shutdowns. The 20 Cuban authorities have taken a hard line after the biggest anti-government demonstrations in 30 years. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and look at how news is reported. And when it's not. Cubans waited a long time to get access to information over the internet. Their government, faced with nationwide protests, has been pulling the plug. It's a war of narratives, with the authorities turning protest songs into propaganda. Whether they're taking penalty kicks or taking a knee, black footballers playing for England are dealing with abuse online. But sports activism is on the rise around the world, and social media is at the center of it all. Cuba is witnessing something historic, its biggest anti-government demonstrations in 60 years. In response, communist leaders are calling supporters onto the streets to protect the revolution against an opposition movement that has come together online. An economy long damaged by the U.S. trade embargo, then devastated by the pandemic, has led to shortages of the basics, food, electricity, water. Many Cubans say their problems run deeper than that. The days of the island being digitally disconnected from the outside world are gone. Citizens have taken to platforms like WhatsApp, Twitter and Telegram to talk about economic mismanagement and corruption, what they call failings of the state. The president, Miguel Diaz-Canel, is pointing the finger at Washington for waging a covert information war orchestrating what's unfolding on the streets through misleading social media campaigns paid for with U.S. tax dollars. And the Cuban authorities have imposed temporary blocks on the Internet, making credible media coverage and reliable information that much harder to find. Our starting point this week is Havana. An unprecedented series of anti-government demonstrations. Cuba has seen unprecedented demonstrations. The term unprecedented gets thrown around in news stories, sometimes when it doesn't apply. But what Cuba is experiencing right now, protests across the island over a broken economy, chronic shortages of food and electricity, exacerbated by the pandemic, is without precedent. There's been nothing like this since the communist revolution brought Fidel Castro to power in 1959. The magnitude of this demonstration is completely new for Cuba in the last 62 years. The only example we had of something like this was in 1994 in Old Havana, and it was really easily controlled. But now we have seen thousands of peoples all over the island. More than 60 cities, all the provinces. And it was possible, of course, thanks to social media. It's a perfect storm of all kinds of factors. COVID has really hit hard. The consequences of US sanctions have been dire. And the government has not been able to give people much relief. But, you know, for a couple of years now, Cubans have access to the internet. So there's not just one side of the story anymore. And it's also the first time that we're seeing uh, the government having to deal with a situation like this. And the way they react is by using a narrative that is no longer effective. That narrative, forged by the state and pushed by broadcast outlets that remain tightly controlled, contains some elements of truth. It blames Cuba's economic problems on the trade embargo, sanctions imposed by Washington. But it's not the full story. Since 2018, when the government opened up internet access, even Cubans who still support the revolution have been going online talking about the mismanagement of their economy. When the protests went national, the authorities imposed an internet blackout that has made it virtually impossible for citizens to get online and for news outlets on the outside, like ours, to connect to sources and interviewees on the island. These blackouts 
are working as fuel for the fire. Right now we are almost 48 hours without regular connection and people asking the government to stop to doing this because they have not been able to communicate with their families in Cuba. They are just creating more problems for the people and the people will keep criticizing the government for their bad management of this crisis. And this silence um, also allows like a widespread of fake news. Any report can come from anyone from a anywhere in the country and you don't have ways as a journalist or even as a common citizen to check whether this information is uh, real or not. You don't have any way to verify. As a human rights lawyer, I of course oppose mass blackouts. I support the right to receive and spread information. What I don't support is the right for outside aggressors, particularly who are intent on regime change influencing that country. They're temporarily restricting access to social media sites. Well, that in combination with what we already know about the size, scope, and duration and manipulation of the Cuban message by outside aggressors seems to me not the most unreasonable step. This is one of the areas where the Cuba story grows murky. How much of the social media content that's been powering the protests, how many of the hashtags have been created by Cuban citizens, and how much of that has been manufactured by online operatives, hostile ones, working abroad? Starting with the SOS Cuba hashtag, which grew central to the protest movement, researchers have traced its origins to Spain with apparent connections to Argentina. Cuba already has limited access to internet. And so the proliferation of such a hashtag raised a lot of flags for me. There were hundreds of thousands of fake posts by tens of thousands of fake accounts. We are able to trace some of the posts back to a number of individuals uh, in Argentina, uh, a country known for right-wing dedication to neoliberal politics. Um, that illustrates the undue influence that's going on right now in SOS Cuba. There simply isn't the capacity for this type of publication um, from the island itself. I think that that's something people should look into. Uh, but I don't think that this whole thing was engineered in, in the sense that you can't force an uprising. And the U.S. has been trying to force an uprising for years in Cuba. Ultimately, you have to have a large number of Cuban people who are going to go along with the idea of going out into the streets. These are not paid dissidents. These are people who are just desperate and, and, wanting, to, and, and wanting change. The U.S. government has also directed hundreds of millions of dollars to Cuban activists and new media platforms critical of the communist government. And that's been paying dividends ever since Miguel Diaz Canel, who later inherited the leadership of the Communist Party from Raul Castro, loosened the government's reins on what had been a tightly controlled, poorly funded digital space. After his government imposed the blackouts, Diaz Canel said social media was creating dissatisfaction rather than reflecting it. Pero la manera en que están usando Internet en estos momentos y que están usando las redes sociales eh, es realmente intoxicante, es enajenante, eh, provoca muchas angustias con tantas mentiras y yo creo que es una expresión de terrorismo mediático. Don't buy the story that the Miguel Díaz Canel is a reformist and he wants to open up the country to more democratic spaces. Miguel Díaz-Canel opened the country to internet because in order to attract foreign investment, to modernize, they have to open the country to internet. They had to, but they didn't want it. Five years ago, in 2016, journalists were covering what they called the Cuban thaw 
when President Obama and Raul Castro agreed to start normalizing relations, lifting travel restrictions, and opening embassies in each other's capitals. Donald Trump later put an end to much of that, and President Biden now says he stands with the Cuban people, the same people the U.S. first imposed sanctions on 60 years ago, ostensibly to protect America from a communist threat that, if it ever existed, no longer does. If there is one unintended beneficiary of the trade embargo, it would be Cuba's political leadership. The sanctions gift the powers that be in Havana something that every government wants, someone to blame. And that's a narrative that is everlasting. The U.S. embargo has actual effects on the Cuban economy and the Cuban people's lives, and also has been working as an as excuse for the Cuban government for every mistake they do. No taking responsibility for, for what's the situation in Cuba and regards to their uh, management. U.S. government policies are aimed at creating hunger and desperation, and now we have it. And so some of what's going on in Cuba is a direct consequence of U.S. policy, but, but not all of it. Someone would really have to study this to figure out, okay, what was caused by the embargo and what was caused by the internal inability to handle the economic crisis. Yeah, of course people should be allowed uh, to take the streets. However, the size, scope, and magnitude is being distorted by outside influences masking the reality of the situation of the Cuban people, which, if you had to poll, which would they prefer? an end to the Cuban embargo or an end to the Castro socialist project, it would overwhelmingly be hands off Cuba, American imperialists get out. The issue of online racism has dominated political debate in the United Kingdom this past week after black players on the England football team were abused following the final of this year's European Championship, Euro 2020. Tarek Nafa is here to take us through what we saw online after the match. Well, within minutes of England losing that game on penalties, the three black players who missed their penalty kicks, Bukaya Saka, Jaden Sancho and Marcus Rashford, were getting abused on social media, some of those posts even including emojis of monkeys. And British police now say they're investigating several cases of racist abuse, but tracking down those responsible isn't easy because most of the accounts are anonymous. So rather than celebrating their best tournament result in more than 50 years, the aftermath here has been ugly. Exactly. It's important to keep in mind, though, that the racist backlash didn't start with that penalty shootout. Several black England players have faced similar kinds of racist abuse before and say that unfair criticism has been leveled at them by the UK's right wing press. Marcus Rashford, for example, who's spoken out on child poverty, he's frequently the subject of dubious stories in the tabloids about his lavish lifestyle and his, quote, luxury homes. Contrast that with glowing coverage of campaigning former footballers who are white, like David Beckham. And what about the Johnson government? What's its position on the abuse of its footballers? Well, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has called the abuse appalling. Critics, among them former and current England players, have accused Johnson and his Home Secretary, Priti Patel, of being hypocrites because they failed to back the England team's stand against racism. Here's Patel speaking last month about players taking the knee before matches. I just don't support, you know, people participating in, you know, that type of gesture, gesture politics to a certain extent as well. Tyrone Mings, another black member of the England squad, summed it up in this tweet to Patel, saying, you don't get to stoke the fire at the beginning of the tournament by labelling our anti-racism message as gesture politics and then pretend to be disgusted when the very thing we're campaigning against happens. OK, thanks, Tarek. It's not just footballers taking a knee. All kinds of athletes are taking part in acts of protest. On tennis and basketball courts, baseball fields and hockey rinks, just about anywhere that athletes compete, they're putting their political and social activism out there for sports fans to see. 
ever since the 1960s and 70s, when African Americans like Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar brought the civil rights movement to a wider audience, they've been told the world of sports should not be politicized. Or as LeBron James, the basketball star, has been told, shut up and dribble. That kind of argument just doesn't fly anymore. Social media has allowed this generation of athletes to get around billionaire owners and broadcasters uncomfortable with mixing sports and politics. Now they can connect directly with their millions of fans. And that's forcing leagues, federations, and the brands that athletes represent to do something they've long tried to avoid, take a position on social issues. The Listening Post's Johanna Hoos now on sports activism in the era of social media. My name is Khalida Popal. I am former captain of Afghanistan women's national team. For me, uh, football has been always a great tool for my activism to be voice for voiceless women in a war-torn country and male-dominated country like Afghanistan, where women and girls have nearly no right. One of the great tools that has helped me all the time was the access to, to social media. It has given me a platform where I connect with other people around the world. Khalida Popal is a sports star whose social media messaging has got game. She aligns with the likes of basketball player LeBron James, footballer Marcus Rashford, and tennis player Naomi Osaka, athletes who combine action on the field or the court with activism on the web. Raising awareness about issues like inequality, racism, and police violence, bringing politics into a realm that hasn't always welcomed it, the world of sports. For too long, athletes were considered to be unintelligent performers which is really not the case. We've seen sports be a vehicle for really important discussions about anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, homophobia, Islamophobia. We have to remember sports has always been a political space. Players from marginalized communities have more labor that is expected of them, as opposed to like a white, straight footballer who doesn't have to worry about their humanity. So fighting for equality and equity. These are things that marginalized athletes have always had to do. What's interesting is that athletes now are seeing an opportunity and they've got their own platforms now to speak out at scale and in collaboration with other athletes of similar prominence. You could take the women's NBA as a whole speaking out about racial justice. Megan Rapinoe on behalf of the US women's football team in relation to social issues as well, she stepped up. Marcus Rashford took on the British government twice over supplying free school meals to children in poverty. It's important to remember there's a huge tradition of athletes speaking out. It's a tradition that goes back to at least 1936, the year numerous athletes boycotted the Berlin Olympics in protest against the rise of Nazism in the country. Three decades later, sprinters John Carlos and Tommy Smith brought American civil rights issues into the Mexico Olympics raising their fists in a black power salute. They were fighting the same fight as boxing champion Muhammad Ali. Ali was a force in the ring and had heavyweight communication skills. My fight is legal, but if you notice, I'm been the most persecuted. He brought those skills to issues like racial inequality and the war in Vietnam. But sports stars have paid the price for their activism. When Ali refused to fight in Vietnam, he was stripped of his title and barred from fighting for three of his prime years. Sprinters Carlos and Smith were dropped from the US track team, and more recently, NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick lost his job for silently protesting social injustice. No other team has touched him since. When confronted with politics, the sports industry finds itself compromised. It's wary of upsetting conservative audiences, a position summed up in the 90s by basketball superstar and the face of sports clothing brand Nike, Michael Jordan, who said, conservatives buy sneakers too. Since the late 1960s, the sport industry has grown at an astronomical level, right? Television money, advertising money, uh, the influx of corporate sponsorships really skyrocket. So that meant that athletes like a Michael Jordan figure could be successful on the court, but could be really successful in terms of advertising. And in order to become a corporate icon, you have to have a very sanitized image. Sports are 
broadcast all over the world. And consumers of those sports have a wide range of social values, traditional values, and sponsors like to play it safe. And an athlete who's outspoken on global platforms about issues that many people are conservative about is a threat to their income streams. And that's a natural clash between the desires of capitalism, the desires sometimes of social progress, social justice, whatever you'll call it. Over the past decade, social media has rewritten the rules, allowing athletes to circumvent media gatekeepers and communicate directly with fans. In 2018, the British footballer Raheem Sterling took to Instagram to accuse sections of the British press of fueling racism with their portrayal of black players. In the past, Sterling would have to go through those same media outlets to get his message out. Now, he can share it with his millions of followers with just one click. As Kalida Popal can tell you, that's a game changer. In 2018, unfortunately, our national team uh, faced a major challenge, a culture of sexual abuse in Afghanistan Football Federation. And the creator of that culture was the former president of Afghanistan Football Federation. And the only thing I was thinking about how I can use my social media channel to raise awareness about what is happening with the national team. We received a lot of hate messages and backlash from the Football Federation and people who are against our fight or against um, our campaign. But we managed to get a lot of support for our players. The ways in which, you know, previous athletes had used platforms for activism, the difference lies in athletes now have their social media at their fingertips. So Muhammad Ali didn't have Twitter. Can you imagine if Muhammad Ali had Twitter? I mean, it would be the best Twitter account ever. But the thing is, is that their messages in previous days were still they were still funneled through media. They were still funneled through journalists who did have their own biases and own agendas. And now there's no filter. The evidence of that was all over social media in 2020, when athletes spoke out as never before. The murder of an unarmed black American, George Floyd, acted as a catalyst resulting in an explosion of activism on the streets and online. No peace. No a new global Black Lives Matter movement was born and sports stars amplified the message. Leagues, federations and sponsors had no choice but to start paying attention. 2020 was a year where athletes around the world uh, spoke up almost in an unprecedented manner. And I think that's because you had this combustible situation of the pandemic. Those frustrations built up, right, in the broader public. And that spilled out into the sports world. Along with, of course, the viral circulation of the murder of George Floyd, really unleashing this global social protest movement. And that athletes then were following the lead of the people in the streets. They didn't create these movements. They were really amplifiers of the issues that were already at play. You can do it to raise your game. For those keeping score, it would be sports activists won, sports industry nil. Now, brands like Nike, Adidas and New Balance are throwing their weights behind sports activists. The UK's Premier League has launched a No Room for Racism action plan, while the WNBA formed a Social Justice Committee. It's not as though leagues and sponsors have suddenly developed a social conscience and are now sacrificing their bottom lines to embrace these causes. They have been made to realize that in 2021, failing to do that would hurt, not help their businesses. It's opportunism, fueled more by profits than principle, but the athletes will take it. It's a win-win. Now, athletes can be crystal clear and the hesitancy to speak up is less. Because what company or like what brand are going to say, we don't want you to talk about this because that athlete will say they wanted to silence me. And then what happens? Then the fans come out. Public support cannot be overstated here because it, they're considered consumers, they're clients of companies that are supporting and funding, but also they have a say in sport. And for too long, the fans and the athletes were regarded as the lesser players in this and that's completely flipped it's on its head now and finally back to Cuba and a case of if you can't suppress them join them earlier this year an artists collective released a protest song Patria y Vida Homeland 
and life. That's a play on Fidel Castro's motto, homeland or death, a choice that many Cubans have rejected by leaving the island. The song went viral in a big political way, so the authorities banned it and arrested some of those involved, but they can't make the song go away. Instead, they've produced a slew of state-backed remixes released on government-run television channels and websites. Here's one version. It's called Homeland or Death for Life. In Cuba, the beat goes on. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. <laughs> Que estás contra la pobreza Si en tercio pelo y satín Se revuelca tu vilesta De esa forma te desprecian Así tarifan tu honor Los que te rentan la voz Los que te incitan a odiar Dale agua a ese dominó Si a ti la vida te estresa Y la coges con tus hermanos No sabes de dominó Son 62 victorias, 62 mil te esperan, millones diría yo. Rentabiliza el charrudo, sobre tu patria 